Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputtasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputtasa Puthang tamang sankhang kunutarang upachayang namasami Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone, and um, express my um, pleasure appreciation of uh, being able to stay in this wonderful monastery again and to uh, meet some old friends, especially Jan Amaro, one of my oldest and dearest friends, and some uh, new bhikkhus and, and seminarists that I've not met before and to just to spend a few days uh, with the Sangha here. It's a very um, precious opportunity, uh, particularly um, given the vagaries of travel these days and the difficulties caused by COVID, which you are all familiar with. So today is um, a very special day, actually. It's, I would go so far as to say it is a, a unique day. Um, today is the, the 3rd of April, 2022. This is the first and only and ever 3rd of April 2022 that there will ever be in the history of the universe. There's never been a 3rd of April 2022 before and there will never be again. This is absolutely unique. There's never been a 1 o'clock in the afternoon of the 23rd of April 2022 ever before and there will never be again. There's never been this inhalation or this exhalation ever before and ever again. So it is an absolutely unique um, occasion and I'm very happy to be able to grace it, I hope, if that's not too grand a word, um, with some words of, of Dhamma and encouragement and my um, first involvement with this um, group, this, this Sangha, began in May 1978 in, in London, in, uh, um, in the Wihara, on the hill opposite the pub, near the park. And it's led me uh, led me to a very long and and um, happy life, and so um, recalling my first exposure to this sangha, then the teaching that inevitably comes to mind is of the four noble truths, and the teaching that's been so um, beautifully and um, and clearly expounded by Lumpur Sumeto and Jan Amaro over the years. So to add um, a few words of my own. I'd like to begin with um, talking a little bit about this very difficult word or the most difficult word in, in Buddhism, Dukkha. And uh, you'll all probably have heard monks um, complaining that it's almost, almost impossible or is impossible to translate. And 
In, in some ways, I think the word dukkha could be compared to a, a koan in the Zen Buddhist tradition because the, the full understanding of the meaning of the word dukkha is only experienced, is only known by the arahant. It is arahantship, it is the moment of enlightenment, is the full comprehension of dukkha. And simultaneously with that is the abandonment of the cause of dukkha and the realization of liberation and the fulfillment of the Eightfold Path. So a, a point here is to remind ourselves that even though we have a certain intellectual understanding of what the word dukkha, or usually um, for want of a better alternative translated as suffering or unsatisfactoriness, we have some idea of what that means. We have some experience, perhaps, of what it means. But we need to remind ourselves we don't actually know what this word's referring to in, in its fullness and its, uh, its profundity. And that the practice of Dhamma is the practice to understand this word, this, or, or at least what this word refers to. So uh, let me um, just suggest one or two alternative translations or ways of approaching this idea. Nibbana is very rarely um, defined by the Buddha, but one of the words that's used to refer to it, or one of the phrases, I should say, is the supreme sukha or supreme happiness. So from that we can conclude that everything other than Nibbana is a less than supreme happiness. So my suggestion is we can define dukkha as a lack of true happiness. I like this, this phrase or this, this way of looking at dukkha because it, um, it helps us to avoid this sense of, uh, I don't really have very much dukkha in my life, I'm doing quite well, I'm healthy, I've got a happy family life, my, my career is going well, I've got good friends, I have no financial, um, too many financial pressures, and, and so for someone who's doing reasonably well in life, then the teaching of dukkha can seem, yes, I can see there's something to it, but it's not pressing right now. It's not, you know, um, an existential crisis um, that I need to be looking into. But the Buddha is, uh, uh, is saying something much more profound than, you know, we've all got problems. Um, the, Buddha, uh, the Buddha is saying that our experience, all of our experience, lacks true happiness. So we, are, we can experience all kinds of pleasures and happiness in life. Um, Buddhism not just taking a, a sign of a, a grumpy uh, kind of um, attitude to life and say you think you're happy but you're not really you know you're just deluding yourself and that kind of um, I, I have heard that attitude actually being um, expressed by monks um, but Buddha I, I, I think that the Buddha recognized there is pleasure there is legitimate forms of happiness in the world of course um, but they are conditioned, they are unpredictable, they, they are unreliable, um, they are flawed to one extent or another. 
So comparison, making comparisons can be can be wise and it can be unwise. You know, if you're comparing yourself to your your looks and your attractiveness to other other um, beings, then um, we have so much access to images of other human beings these days that you're always going to find someone who's more attractive than you are somewhere, more, more intelligent than you are. And comparing yourself with others is often um, a way to, or usually a way to immediate discontent. But there are wise comparisons. One of the important teachings and one that I was um, discussing with the, with the Sangha um, yesterday was our attitude to sensual pleasures. So again, I don't think in, in, in the Dhamma we're, we're taking this like Puritan view that it feels good, therefore it's bad for me and I'm a bad person because I enjoy these things. I should, I should be better than this. But what the, um, the Buddha is pointing out is the, that we um, lack a perspective on these, happy, these kinds of happiness, these, or these kinds of pleasure. And I think we can all think of, of people who are very intelligent in the conventional sense, um, and yet are addicted in one to one degree or another to things that they know are not in their best interests, either physically or mentally. And they know it would be better to let go of those things, but they can't. And my observation or my interpretation is that often people will say, yes, I, I realize this is not bringing me any true fulfillment or happiness, that probably the cons outweigh the pros when I look at it coolly and objectively, but still, I can't let it go. And my, my interpretation is that people want something in their life. And in a final analysis, something is always better than nothing in the mind of the, in the unenlightened mind. So there's this fear, yes, this is unsatisfactory, this is not really working out how I'd hoped it to, it's not really, um, doesn't really give me the pleasure that I like to think it does, but still, it's better than nothing. And the fear of nothing is a very powerful fear. So, uh, and it's not one that can be overcome intellectually, I don't think. So this is why the Buddha um, emphasized the importance of meditation. Because in meditation, and I think only in meditation, in any kind of systematic or sustained sense, you can have an experience of a non-sensual happiness, and one which, without doubt, there's, there's no question uh, for those who experience it, that it is superior. That that's, it, it, there's just this sense, yes, this is so superior to the pleasures of the senses. And the value of that is that coming out of that state or uh, regularly entering and leaving that state, now you have a new kind of comparison. You're not comparing a, an unsatisfactory experience with nothing, but you're you're, you're comparing an unsatisfactory experience with something which is, in a way, a foretaste, just a slight um, 
idea of what Nibbana might be. It's not Nibbana, but it's a, just a little idea of, you know, the path towards Nibbana and what Nibbana might be. So having that kind of access means that you are now able to let go of the more destructive kinds of sense pleasure because you know that there's something that you can turn to which is superior to it. So this is a wise comparison. Now this doesn't mean that lay meditators who develop good samadhi um, turn away from the sensual world and they all want to become monks and nuns. Um, I can reassure you that I, I know many, many uh, good meditators and that hasn't um, become their, their path in life. But it's a more relaxed attitude to sense pleasures. They're a bonus in your life rather than the heart of it. And they are something that can be enjoyed with, with restraint and with a sense of um, uh, moderation and in ways which are not in conflict with your core values and not causing distress to yourself or others. So it's a moderating influence and creating um, an intelligence around your consumption of pleasures in the world rather than a complete absence from them. Yeah, you can enjoy them, but if you're deprived of them at some time or another, not the end of the world by any means. You have something to compare them with. The other advantage of developing meditation, again, is that you now come to have a better understanding of the word defilement. So that the Pali word kilesa, again, it's a it's, it's difficult word. I, I've never liked defilement because to my mind at least, defilement sounds as if it's something permanent. You know, once you're defiled by something in the common sense, you can't become undefiled. It's, it's like marked for life. Whereas the kilesa or the defilement are things that arise and pass away and that you can feed or you can starve or you can, um, you can put in the center of your life or you can uh, eventually eliminate. But the, the, um, the idea of a... a um, of a defilement is something which defiles or discolors or, or spoils something. And unless you have, again, you have that um, instinct and you, you have that access, at least temporarily, to one degree or another, of an undefiled mind, then defilement doesn't seem such a big deal or usually it's like who you are. So um, the, this morning I was talking about this saying it's like you, you've only ever lived in a, um, a dirty environment and then one day you, you enter a, a clean room and you say, oh, this is what clean means, you know, I never, really, and then you go back to your room or your place, you say, wow, this is so dirty. You hadn't realized it before because everybody's place is like this, you know, nobody you know, thinks, well, that's, that's what it's like. Um, but now you have something to compare it to. So just as a, a digression here, one of the reasons why in our tradition we um, refuse to make these very clear-cut distinctions between like samatha and vipassana and, and calming meditations and, and wisdom meditations is because you can see merely the experience of samadhi which would 
Uh, most people would say that's a samatha or a calming uh, meditation um, can lead to uh, a whole a revolution in your value system and the way that you live your life and the way that you re relate to other people, your goals in life, um, because it, it brings into question that experience brings into question so many things that you've taken for granted. So I would say that's wisdom, um, being able to see clearly, to have a new perspective on your life, to be able to stand back from things you've taken from granted. So, yes, so I, I've made two points here. One, one is that with, uh, without this inner cultivation and inner samadhi, and samadhi then uh, the addiction to sense pleasures um, is very hard to shake. And secondly, the, the sense of understanding of defilement um, is not clear in the mind. You know, of course, if you have some very coarse defilements that cause you a lot of problems in your life, whether it's uh, anger, jealousy, and so on, that, that's easier to see. But there are many, many more subtle defilements. And they only become um, clear when you have um, something reasonably um, undefiled to compare it to. So the value of, of um, seeing defilements and having something to compare them to is to understand this first two noble truths. And like dukkha is caused by defilement. So as you know, uh, uh, perhaps in the, uh, in the Pali formulation, the word the Buddha uses is tanha or craving. But it's not um, restricted to, to craving. It's, it's all the defilements. But craving is the, um, is the, is the inevitable expression of ignorance. So when we say dukkha, um, the lack of true happiness, the uh, fundamentally flawed state uh, or character of experience is caused by craving, then we can imagine a, like a, a sort of parenthesis, a little um, bracket with the word ignorance. So craving is ignorant desire. So in Pali you have this, this phrase like avijja or ignorance equals craving. Vijja, which is knowledge, understanding, insight, is accompanied by chanda or dhamma chanda, which is wholesome desire. So this again really um, a point that cannot, I think, be emphasized enough that Buddhism is not um, teaching that suffering is caused by desire and to get, you should get rid of suffering by getting rid of all desire. That has never been the Buddhist teaching at all. Um, the Buddha says that suffering is caused by ignorant desire or craving. And on the path towards the liberation from ignorant desire, you must depend, um, certainly to begin with, with wholesome desire. So wholesome desire, chanda is an element of the path to liberation. So we're talking about channeling this energy of desire from unwholesome desire into wholesome desire. So craving and unwholesome desire is characterized by desire for the results of things. And wholesome desire is, is characterized by desire to do. So if you have a desire to help someone who's suffering, to make the world a better place in whatever way you can, that's not called craving, that's chanda, to 
um, to do your job, you know, fulfill your responsibilities in the best possible way you can. This is chanda, this is wholesome desire. It's not dhanha, it's not rooted in ignorance. And psychologically, you can see this is not a philosophical distinction here. You can observe in your own, own mind that whenever there is the ignorant desire of craving, there is always agitation in the mind. It's not peaceful. Whereas the chanda desire is accompanied by peace and, and a sense of pramod, pamoja and well-being and, and a sense of joy. So we, in using, in, 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 meditation, in meditation, you will have observed, I'm sure, um, at the beginning at least, that um, meditation stirs up defilements. Um, that's how it feels. But of course, defilements are not caused by meditation. They are illuminated by them. And to see defilements clearly and to understand how they work, how they um, wax, how they wane, how they're fed, how they're uh, weakened, how they're eliminated, you have to see them. And the, this initial technique, it's, it's so incredibly simple, but very, very effective, is you just give the mind a job to do. You say, stay on the breath, or stay on a word, or stay on a physical sensation. It's got to be something simple. And, and when you try and give your mind just one job to do, then it rebels. And then you start to see all these mental states, not as, I'm feeling bored, I'm agitated, I'm, uh, I'm depressed, I'm lazy, I'm this, I'm that. But now you're seeing, oh, drowsiness is arising in my mind and preventing me from meditating on the breath. Or there is agitation in the mind. There's confusion, there's doubt. Um, there's, there's irritation, aversion. There's discouragement, there's expectation. So it, it's a really marvelously simple um, process here that you begin to understand mental states as mental states, thoughts as thoughts, feelings as feelings, um, simply by asking your mind to stay with one thing. So now you're, you have, you have a, uh, you've, you've still divided your inner world up into two. It's, it's not a complete unity yet. Um, but it's, it's, it's very important because now you have the meditation object, say the breath, and then you have everything else which is not the meditation object. So you're looking at your inner world in a very different way already. And that, that is a, a really crucial moment in your life of wandering in samsara, to be able to step back from all these things that you are accustomed to believe who you are, um, and to see that these are conditioned mental states that arise and pass away according to causes and conditions. So here already, at this very beginning stage, where most people think they're all ready to give up, you know, I can't do this, when I try and keep my, I can't do it, my mind goes here and goes there, and assuming that they're doing something wrong, when in fact they're doing something very right, because they are um, facing up to and being looking at what's really going on in their minds in a way they've never been able to before. But here, um, I think that we, you have to be very, of course, very patient um, and not to, um, say, get identified with these, the commentary about the meditation. So we always have this, the commentator standing behind and saying, I can't do this, it's too hard, and there's this hope. But the thing to key 
insight here is that the commentary is also part of the meditation. There's no, there's no real commentator standing over and apart the meditation process. You know, this this comment, commentary, that's also part of it. So looking at the mind in this way and trying to sustain this clarity and sharpness and presence of mind um, by, by sustaining attention on an object illuminates defilements. But we're starting to have our first or, or in, increasingly understanding the second, how the second noble truth works. Defilements are the cause of suffering. We, we, we suffer because of defilements. So again, it's such a simple, straightforward statement and one that we've, for Buddhists, we've heard this so many times before. But it's so easy to forget, isn't it? And then when we, in our, langu our language encourages us to look for scapegoats, you know, he hurt me so much, she, she really upset me. Um, this happened and just made me so, so sad. And so, so we, we attribute agency over ourselves, over our mind, over our mental state to other people and to situations and events. But what the Buddha is saying is that nothing and nobody can force you, uh, compel you to suffer. This is a huge statement, um, but I think it, it's, it's not that difficult to, to, to prove this. A, a very simple example, if you had a, a candle flame, for instance, and um, a, a foolish person would put their, touch the candle flame and their, their hand would burn. A good person, a, a wise person, a, an enlightened being, whatever their mental, social, um, spiritual maturity would have no effect at all. If they, if they put their hand on a flame, it would burn because this is the nature of human skin when it comes into contact with heat. So we can say in the physical realm, it's quite legitimate to say, he hurt me, he thumped me, he kicked me, he did this, he did that, and it really hurt. Or I fell over, or I, um, I had an accident, and you know, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain. So, so that's reasonable to say that we, physical pain is the result of trauma, of, of something bad happening to the physical body. But let's say someone uh, treats another person with complete contempt, which is one of the worst things that you can experience and the hardest to, to, to deal with, isn't it? Now, if, if a fool um, is treated with contempt, then they will have a very strong reaction. Someone who's meditated a bit, and someone who's a little wiser, not so strong, and an enlightened person would have no reaction to it. So here there's the same input, words of contempt, but the experience of it is mediated by the maturity of the person who is treated that way. And so we can conclude from this that it's not the words themselves, it's not the um, it's not the actions or the words or the events themselves that cause um, human suffering without some thing added onto it. And the thing that we add onto it is what we call craving. Okay. So this, this is the, the revolutionary teaching here that for human suffering to take place, there are two things necessary. 
you know, an event, an action, someone's, someone does something, somebody says something, some, you know, some situation, there's that plus craving in your heart. So your, your ability to control your environment and to, to prevent people treating you badly um, is, is uh, very restricted, isn't it? And you can't rely on that. I mean, you can um, take measures to avoid being into such situations and so on and so forth. That's what we call vinaya. But the, the dhamma means that we have a hope here. We're not lost case. We don't just have to put up with it. Because the intensity of the suffering that we experience and the existence of the suffering or the... the, the, the um, uh, an unsatisfactory experience is dependent upon the presence or absence of defilement in the mind. So we can reduce and we can eliminate suffering, but not difficulties. You know, we, it's like we're on a, a bumpy road. You know, we can do something about the suspension on our vehicle. But if we um, become wise and peaceful and uh, compassionate beings, it doesn't mean that we no longer have to drive over bumpy roads. Um, there's some people feel that, oh, I've done all these good things in my life. Why, why did this happen and why did that happen? Well, you're, you're driving a bumpy road. That's what bumpy roads are like. But the question is, you know, how you deal with it. And the Buddha says that our capacity to deal with it is not fixed. It's something that can be trained. And the Eightfold Path is, um, I, would, I would characterize it as the supreme and, and complete and most profound and most effective education system that the world has ever seen. So whereas most of the major religions in the world we can characterize as essentially belief systems, the unique feature of Buddhism is that it's not a belief system, it's an education system. And that we only become true Buddhists by embarking on this education. It's educational training of our, spe our actions, our speech, our emotions, our thinking, the way that we look at the world, the way we frame our experience. This is what it means to be a Buddhist. You know, we have these rituals and ceremonies and all these things, and they have a role to play. Um, they, but they're not the heart of it. You know, the heart of it is not just saying, yes, I believe um, in this, this, and this. Uh, it means I'm taking this on. I'm taking on this education. In the, in the ceremony um, that we... Um, performed this morning the precept ceremony. If you look at the wording, well, first of all, observe that that precept ceremony always has to be preceded by a request. It's not like Ajahn Amaro says, everyone sit down, I'm going to give you the precepts, you know. Um, it's for your own good. You have to ask for the precepts. If you don't ask, he won't give them to you. He can't. You have to ask first. So there has to be this movement from you. You have to want to keep the precepts. Now, in the wording of the precepts, they say the first one, panati pata, verapmani, sikhapadang samadhyami. This word, sikhapadang, sikha and padang. So padang means um, uh, um, an item, I'm thinking Thai, a core, it's, it's um, yeah, an item of training. So sikhar is, is the same root as the Thai word siksa, or, or education, or training. So when you take the first precept, what you're saying is, I undertake the training of my conduct through refraining from harming other beings. So it's, it's a training, it's a practice of mindfulness and awareness. So there has to be this voluntary, um, this commitment 
to, to training of action, speech, of the mind, of the understanding, for us to um, be fully um, to become, let's say, complete Buddhists. And the the word for one of my favorite words for epithets for the arahant is the aseka pugala, which translates translates most simply as the graduate. So the Buddha is uh, the arahant is the one who's graduated. He's 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 done he's done the whole education. He's he's taken the tests and he's he's come out with flying colors. He's the graduate. And so all of us are uh, apart from the graduate. We're all students. So we're students of life. We're students of this life. We're students of this body, this mind. Um, and this is the, 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 the should be the key attitude that we have as Buddhists. We're learning. We're learning stuff. And um, sometimes people start start to meditate, and um, they go on courses and they go home, and maybe they get irritated and they lose their temper. And somebody and their spouse says. Well, I thought you were meditating. I thought you were peaceful. I thought you'd gone beyond all this. You sort of say this, say these things sometimes. Maybe not in England, but in Thailand they do. And and people find that really frustrating when they're confronted in that way. But uh, my my advice is to say, well, in one sense, it's like you're. You're a patient in a hospital. You know, you started the course of medicine. Of course, you're not completely recovered yet, but you're you're working on it. Um, or, you know, in the education analogy, then you're learning. Yeah, you've not graduated yet, but you're you're getting better. You're working on it. You're a work in progress. So we're using the, the, the threefold training, which is just really to telescope the the Eightfold Path into three areas of conduct, the heart, and uh, understanding. To, um, in order to fully understand the nature of dukkha. So just coming back to this word again, if you think I'm suffering, then that's not an understanding of the first noble truth, because the first noble truth is the um, state of dukkha. It's not I, if you say I am suffering, then you've lost it, because there's, it's being distorted by taking, imagining this self who's the owner of suffering. And one of the, uh, an, another um, point here, and, and this ties up a little with what I was talking earlier, and, and uh, I, I think again is, a really important point to, to, to emphasize is that only a happy mind can understand suffering as a noble truth. You know, if you're a miserable person, then you know, yeah, I'm really having a hard time right now, I'm really suffering. That's nothing to do with the Four Noble Truths. But with a happy mind, you have the stability and the clarity and the, the sense of well-being that allows you to look at life and allows you to see the, the nature of dukkha. So, so this is um, well, a scattergun, scattergun approach to, to dukkha. But uh, another point that comes to mind, and it's perhaps a timely one, is that the experience of, of dukkha um, this is my analogy, is like living in a war zone. Okay, so you might be living in a town in the middle of a war zone and uh, you, you haven't seen any, any planes overhead as yet, you've not been bombed, you've not been attacked. Daily life is probably not very much different than it has been um, for years, but you know that you're in the middle of a war zone 
and that planes could come and bomb you at any moment. Soldiers could appear, tanks could appear um, through the fields outside your village any moment. So, so um, being in a war zone is, doesn't mean that you're in the middle of the fighting and that you're in mortal danger at every moment. But if, if someone was to say, look, you know, we really need to make some defenses here, we need to make some bomb shelters, everything, we're in a war zone, and they were contradicted by, by people who are saying, what are you talking about? It's a beautiful day, you know, we're, uh, we're enjoying ourselves with our children, it's, um, we know, we, we're just going to work in a normal way, don't make such a fuss, you know, don't look, don't look at the world in such a dark and dismal way. You know, you'll think all those people were uh, foolish and ostriches with their heads in the sand. Um, although, by the way, ostriches don't put their heads in the sand. But anyway, that's a different topic altogether. Um, not at least to ex escape from reality. Um, I want to stand up for ostriches here. They've been maligned for a very long time. Um, yes, back to suffering. The, <laughs> the idea is that um, suffering doesn't just mean present, you know, um, experience pain, but it means being in a chronic situation where things can go wrong at any moment. When Dukkha, or the first noble, second noble truth, explained his life is suffering and suffering is caused by desire, a very important qualification is, is omitted there, isn't it? It's that unenlightened life is suffering. Um, because if suffering is, is, uh, is conditioned by defilement, there is an end to defilement, a cessation of defilement through, um, through this education of the Eightfold Path, then, then suffering is not like the one and only um, experience for human beings. We're talking here about unenlightened, untrained experience. So, so if we um, if we we just adapt this translation or or this presentation, but like the unenlightened human life is characterized by a lack of true happiness. Enlightened life uh, is characterized by true happiness. And there is a path from the unenlightened state to the enlightened state called the Eightfold Path. So it's no longer such a, um, a grim and depressing kind of um, way of looking at our human condition at all, is it? So. The, the, Again, one more sort of added layer of this, uh, you know, talking about dukkha and the presence or the, the chronic um, possibility of pain, then we can say it's, let's say, like walking on a tightrope across, you know, uh, you've seen between two mountain tops or to between two high rise buildings. It's like, well, we can, we, can, we can say that the tightrope walker, um, if he loses his mindfulness, even for a moment, he's going to fall and will probably die. So in, in that sense, if we're talking about this in the Pali idiom, we'll say walking a tightrope is, is dukkha. It's dukkha because it's the situation is such that the moment you lose your mindfulness, the moment you lose your wisdom, the moment you, you lose your, your presence of mind, you're in trouble. And this is what the Buddha is saying about our life as human beings, that life is ready to bite you all the time, every moment. Um, that if you lack the protection of the Dhamma, then you are in an extremely vulnerable position. You're in a war zone, as I said, but it's, it's a momentary thing as well. 
And this is so if you have, of course, if you have perfect mindfulness and perfect wisdom, then no problems. But of course, you don't. So you, you do have problems. Um, but the problems are that the nature of things is that it will cause pain if you don't deal with it correctly. This, this is the, the, the dukkha nature of the world, if you like. It's always ready. It's always in such a state that if you're not careful, um, you're going to have a, a tumble. You're going to be in trouble. That's why it is so pressing and important that you work on, on the Dhamma. You, you apply yourself to this education that the Buddha provided us with um, in order that we can say, just as um, you, you can say if you've got um, a, a, a good protection and you have the, the knowledge and the understanding of how to deal with challenges, that you, ha you have a certain confidence. You know, you say, yeah, I'm ready for this. And this is what we call heedfulness. My Brahmat is, is like you, you're learning, you have some facility, you have some skill, you know how to use the Buddha's tools. And you're not saying it has to be like this, it has to be like that, it can come in any, any form you like, but you know I have the tools that I need. The Buddha has given me the tools that I need to be able to survive and flourish, whatever happens. It's just a matter of developing my skill in the use of these tools. So if we worry about what's the world going to be like, what's going to happen with global uh, climate change, with AI, with um, nuclear proliferation, et cetera, et cetera, that, that's just, there's no end to that. Um, and there's no, there, there's no answers to that. We can't know. And there are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns. And, you know, we, that's not the path to, to peace. The peace is, well, what have we got right here? And how can we maximize what we've got right here to the extent that we're ready? You know, to the extent we'll bring it on. You know, I, I, I've got what I need. And you know, we're so fortunate that, as I say, we have the Buddhist teachings. Um, and not only that, um, for all of you, not living in a, a Buddhist nation, but being fortunate enough to have a monastery like Amarawati to be able to, to come to, to make merit, to offer dana, to keep precepts, to learn how to train your mind, how to use um, these these gifts, these tools that the Buddha have, um, wonderful teacher and um, growing and sangha. It's just um, making, taking advantage of it and putting it to use in your own life for your own benefit and and the, your own happiness, but also to be able to create and contribute to the happiness and welfare of others. So I would like to uh, end my discourse at this point.